Thank you for all these <laughs> wonderful people here today. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Boran, as Jazz has already introduced. Uh, I'm a master's student at University of Birmingham doing philosophy. And I'm going to be talking about my dissertation thesis today. So if at any point anyone wants to ask anything, if anything I say is unclear, you want me to go over it, then please raise a hand. So I want to start with a question. And this, I, I think we're going to have all hands up in here for this. Has anyone in here at any point purchased something out of the need for some sort of instant gratification with a veil of necessity, you know, you feel like you need something. You don't really, but you go out and buy it because you want that satisfaction. Yeah, I assume so. Okay. Uh, the second thing, it's not, it's, it's not a question. We don't need a show of hands for this one. It's a bit more private. But um, I assume everyone in this room at some point has felt down, unmotivated, depressed. Uh, you're not up for things, you know. You're not, you're not in the same mindset as you would be, usually. Call it depression, anxiety, whatever you want to call it. Uh, the answers to both of these, the fact that we are consuming more, we are seeking more instant gratification at the same time, mental well-being is going down. People are experiencing, especially our generation, especially for millennials, millennials. Uh, we are consuming more than ever, and that's, that's the truth. And mental well-being statistics are falling exponentially. It's not a, it's not a pretty time to have to create and build a life for yourself in this climate. So that's what's driven my research today. Uh, consumerism up, mental well-being down. And to answer this, to look at if there's any correlation between these two, what the relation might be, if at all there is any relation, I work from two premises. Uh, mental well-being at the top there. To attain mental well-being, I argue, one, we need meaning. We need to be able to efficiently apply meaning. Meaning's not inherent in objects externally. Meaning isn't something that just exists in this cup. The person who designed this cup, they have designed it for the purpose of being a drinking utensil. And that's a meaning this person has applied. And it's a meaning I apply to it if I use it in that way. But I could use this cup to, uh, as a pen holder, you know, to grow plants in whatever I, whatever I want. It's the meaning I apply to that cup. Number two, to efficiently apply meaning and to have and feel meaning in the objects and activities that we encounter, we need some sort of inner harmony. And this idea of inner harmony for a flourishing, just, happy life, it's, it appears everywhere throughout history. Plato talks about reason, spirit, desire, harmony of the tripartite soul. And we need this in order to flourish and have a just soul. Buddha talks about the middle way, the moderate harmony between two extremes of living. Carl Jung, a lot more contemporary, he talks about the anima and the animus, the feminine and masculine energies, and you need to balance and harmonize these in order to be happy and psychologically well. I propose a more practical, a more applicable, widespread option for our generation, something that's more relevant to the consumer problem we have today, and that is harmonizing our production consumption rates. As an individual, bringing harmony to how much you produce and how much you consume. So finding the right balance that will enable you to efficiently apply meaning and attain a good state of mental well-being. To look closer at this, I'm going to look through the difficulties created by excessive consumerism and then go on to talk about the difficulties of meaningless production, just to look at the two extremes of the consumption problem today. First point, uh, we seem to have some sort of authentic essential values and desires in life as humans. We have hunger, we have thirst, we have the need to have sex, sexual intercourse, it's a very primal instinct and as much as that we need to socialize, we need to, uh, we, we need to question, we're inquisitive creatures. So we have all these authentic essential values and they need to be met, that we, we spend life uh, being deprived of these values and then seeking to meet them. You get hungry, you eat. You get hungry again, you seek more food. And Marcus has, Herbert Marcus, a German thinker, he has a brilliant theory called repressive desublimation. And he proposes that there are sublime acts and experiences that satisfy these desires and values. But 
with the modern world, with the capitalist uh, system, these sublime acts and experiences are reduced and repressed to these sublimated versions or commodities. They're made tradable goods. So one example of this is pornography. We have the need to fulfill our sexual desire, an authentic essential value, and perhaps we might agree on this, we might not, that's another debate, but perhaps the highest way or the most fulfilling way of uh, meeting that need is through some sort of true intimate sex with a partner that you do have an emotional bond with rather than watching porn. The, the amount of se sensual engagement, the amount of uh, exchange, emotional exchange with watching porn is a lot less and a lot cheaper and a lot easier attained than that intimate sexual bond with a partner. And there's something I want to show you. One of the most famous TV commercials of all time. And it explains a lot better what I'm trying to say here. I'd like to buy the world a home and furnish it with love. Grow apple trees and honey bees and so white turtles. 1971, hence equality. That's nice and noticed, sir. That's important. I'm going to get back to that. Coke's going to fix, bre fix Brexit, is it? Yeah. It didn't fix much of that advert, to be honest. That's what I was going to say. You know you said it's interesting as a black person there, right? Yeah. There's a time of a lot of racial tension, 1971, just after se six, seven years after the Civil Rights Act was passed, etc., etc. Things were still trying to pick itself up. So what they done, they, they found a nice hilltop in Italy. They got all sorts of races there, and... Uh, they all had a bottle of coke in their hands and they're singing about bringing harmony and peace to the world and they, they, they put the coke bottle in front of you and tell you it's a real thing. So they're playing on these authentic essential values of the need it's, and it's a very desperate need at that time as you're all aware. Uh, there's a very desperate need for peace and just that, that escape from all these tensions. It's political tensions, uh, communism, capitalism tensions, uh, racial tensions, it was evident everywhere. And so, if you buy this Coke, you get that, right? It's a, it's a commodity version, it's a desublimated version of a sublime, authentic value or desire we have. And how, do, how does this, or how do these examples uh, negatively impact our ability to apply meaning? Because that's what I'm trying to find. And when you, when you look at the Coke example, or the pornography versus the intimate emotional sex example, there's a cheaper and quicker version that you can opt for and it's much, eas much more easily attained and there seems to be a lot less substance to it, there's less sensual engagement and it's almost like with one option you have one colour of Play-Doh and you make a structure out of that with the, the higher, the purer option you have a range of colours and you can paint a much prettier picture and build a much prettier structure with that Play-Doh so when you opt for the cheaper, quicker, it is quicker, it is cheaper, and it's easier to attain. The porn or the Coke bottle, you drink the Coke and, like, where's the happiness? Like, you're still searching for it. And if there's less substance to work with, there's less to hold on to and apply meaning to. So you've got less in your hands, you've got less colours to work with. You can't apply as much meaning. And because they're much more easily attainable, we keep going for them. Every time you do engage in this commodity acquisition to satisfy one of these authentic values, you feel dissatisfied. It's not completely fulfilling. So the next, the next iPhone comes out, the next sports car comes out, and you go out and buy that, and you hope that this time it's going to get you where you want. This time you're going to feel 
the king and it's like running into a brick wall over and over again hoping that one of these times you're going to make it through that brick wall but uh it, it's, it's not like Harry Potter and the platform of nine and three quarters. You're not going to make it through that brick wall. You have to put in the effort. You have to make the investment and climb over the wall to make it to the other side, to fulfill those authentic essential values completely and truthfully, not with cheap commodities posing as fulfilling uh, opportunities. Next up, the next problem with excessive consumerism uh, nice way to summarize it is a hair versus tortoise. We're all aware of this story, right? Slow and steady wins a race. Uh, and the problem with this is that the tendency to opt for the quicker and cheaper options, it takes us away from the natural, the more natural, the more uh, fulfilling path of slow and steady investment and then gaining the returns from a longer process of investment. You build that relationship, you build the anticipation and you end up with a reward, which is much more satisfying because you've, you've put in that effort. You've invested. The more you invest, the longer you anticipate that reward, and the reward is more fulfilling. And uh, that's the reason I liken it to this. The tortoise wins a race. It's slow and steady. It takes it easy. And it, the, the hare, it, it goes for it, and then it stops, and then it falls asleep. And it, it, it goes for the quicker path. It boasts its efficiency, but it doesn't turn out to be the winner. And Jean Baudrillard in The System of Objects, he has a good quote for this. He says, before, consumption could never conceivably precede production. Work preceded its fruit as cause precedes effect. Today, consumption precedes production, which he highlights as a major problem in our time. So what does this mean for meaning if, if we are opting for the quicker, efficient path, if we're supporting the hare instead of the tortoise? when we should be opting for the tortoise because the tortoise inevitably wins the race. When, you're, when you fall into that state of a lack of mental well-being and motivation and you're not feeling happy, you're not feeling up there, you, you lack the reason and meaning and the purpose to get out of bed and do what it is you need to be doing. Someone might tell you, you know, try this, go for a walk, do this, be productive, try something and you might feel better, take your mind off things. And then you go out and then you'll start a new hobby maybe, you'll try an activity and then it just feels empty and you, you're with friends and everyone's talking around you, but you, you're thinking about th that occasion ending so you can go back to your bed. You don't want to be anywhere. And you tell yourself in the end, you say, I tried, but it didn't work. I tried, but it was empty. I tried things. I tried this. I tried that, but it didn't change anything for me. Because we're so used to clicking, for example, Amazon. You click, you order, and it's at your door the next day, sometimes even the same day uh, delivery. We're used to this cycle of supporting the hair. We're used to this instant gratification. So when it comes to feeling low and you go out and try something, you try a new activity in the hope that it's going gonna, it's gonna to be pr more productive so you can feel less depressed, you come back empty-handed because you expect it to do something for you there and then because we're used to this. Our generation has been conditioned into this instant gratification. And we, we lose, we, we lack that patience and perseverance to go out the next day and try it again and then go out the day after that and try that again. And there's no slow and steady uh, investment or effort where activities have the opportunity to gain meaning slowly. We expect that to happen instantly and it's not going to work. The hair always loses. And it's not just excessive consumerism. There are two, uh, two ideas, the hair, the tortoise, uh, the fulfilling central values. That was for excessive consumerism. Now, meaningless production is also another cause for disharmony in our production consumption race. Uh, there's this pressure, social pressure to be productive. You know, don't procrastinate, do something, be productive. And what counts as productive and what counts as meaningless production is, is sometimes unclear. Productivity just seem, seems sometimes to do anything, anything, just anything that is expected of you. And it's important to make that distinction. Bullshit jobs. One of the biggest problems in our society today. It's, uh, it's actually the title of a book by David Graeber, if that's pronounced right. I think, you know, Ian told me about this book when we were speaking about this. Uh, 
he, he, the whole book is on accounts of people who have messaged him uh, about how unsatisfying and meaningless and purposeless their jobs or their, whatever it is they occupy themselves with, how unsatisfying it is. And I have an example if uh, any of you have watched the US office, Pam, the receptionist. Uh, she's very miserable, isn't she, in the first few series, and she wants to be an artist. And between the faxes and the phone calls, she's always drawing behind the desk. And, and then when she's doing that, she, you know, she's smiling and she's happy, and then other times she's miserable and she engages in, with all these petty pranks and tricks to keep herself occupied and just keep things alive during the day at work. And the problem with this is that there's an illusion of productivity created. You go out to work and you're being productive because you're employed, you're working, right? Uh, the complete illusion, not true. Uh, if you're being productive for the sake of something other than yourself, something that's true to you, and something that feels right for you, you're not being productive. It's meaningless production. And it's just as bad as excessive consumerism. Because it causes the same disharmony and the same uh, balance between production and consumption. Now the problems in terms of uh, applying meaning when you're engaged in this meaningless production you become personally detached from the tasks you're engaging with. You're attempting to be productive. And you've, you've led yourself to believe that you're being productive because you're working nine to five. You've got this routine. You're doing something for society. You're not, you're not a bum. You know, you're not unemployed. And it drains your energy. It drains all your creative energy. Any energy you might have had to manifest what it is you really do want to manifest in this lifetime, you only have one shot at it. It's all being drained. You're, you're drained of any sort of life fuel or energy source that you may have to, to work towards something that will satisfy you, that in the end of it all, you're going to look back and say, I'm glad I've done that, and I'm glad I invested my energy in that. But we're not doing that. It's very difficult to do that because of the financial uh, pressures and social pressures of not being a bum and engaging in productive jobs, etc. Now... We are talking about education and microaggression in education earlier. And this uh, pressure into meaningless production starts from school age, as Jazz, you have experienced this. I had a lot of friends who uh, now, unfortunately, are in a, in a, uh, operating in the underworld, let's say. Let's put it that way. Uh, and at the time, one of them was a great athlete when we first met. He was a brilliant 100-meter sprinter. I used to throw a discus for my school and we'd go to competitions and he was a brilliant runner, truly. And there was another friend who was a great artist, he was a very good painter. And a lot of, them, a lot of people, when I, when I say this and when I explain this, because I was close to him, I knew about this, they say, what him? Because I know what he gets up to now. And the school system and the system by large, they reject these, these uh, talents and they don't, if, if, you're not, if you're not functioning as a successful student in all areas of academia, you're rejected. You're either punished or you're just left to the side to rot in the bottom sets or in isolation, as you were saying. And <laughs> exactly, exactly. The result, uh, these people, they were one of them was good at athletics and the other was good at art. He was a great painter. And if the system was was keen on making these people better rather than improving the overall grade average for the school and their overall reputation. They would take these kids and say, look, you need to invest less time in math, science, whatever it is, and let's work on this because this is what you're good at and this is, what's gonna, this is what you're going to be able to give back to society. You're a good athlete. And clearly you're underperforming in these other lessons. We've tried, we have tried, but it's not working. So let's focus on what you're good at and what you enjoy. But that doesn't happen. You get punished. This uh, one of them, the athlete guy, he would he, he wouldn't come to lessons, or he'd come very late, and then he'd always argue with teachers. He was very he got very aggressive later and later. The, the aggression you could see it developed, and it got much stronger and stronger. And instead of punishing him for this, you got to realize that he's being detained somewhere that he doesn't belong, and somewhere that he's not able to express his energy creatively and fulfillingly. So you lose meaning in the activities you do because. You either abandon them because you now lack the energy for it, because your energy has been drained in maths if all you want to do is uh, invest that energy into a 100 meter sprint and you want to train for that and become a very good athlete, or you want to become a musician or you want to become a dancer or whatever, or 
you abandon these activities because your role models or the authorities that you look up to don't give the same value to that as you do. And I know this from personal experience. Uh, I, I wanted to be a film director and that was, that was inappropriate. That wasn't my potential according to family. I, I was much better off in academia and I'm, I'm grateful that I've, I've had the opportunity to excel and broaden my horizon in philosophy, but you might not be as lucky as this. It, things might go a lot worse for you. And if, you, if the authority figures you look up to are telling you that's not as valuable as you think it is, you no longer have the same energy or motivation to invest into that activity that will truly fulfill you. So what happens, you abandon the things that you can effectively apply meaning to. And it's not just jobs. Uh, a more widespread disease we have today is the priorita prioritization of appearances over art or uh, becoming master of the art. So. Who's, who's seen that? Anyone here seen that Black, uh, Black Mirror episode, Nosedive? The one where everyone like, rates each other off that social media app. And then everything, like, she'll take a small bite of the biscuit just to post it on social media. And it, it's not too different at all. That's not any futuristic event. It exists today. You go out with your friends and everyone's like yeah, uh, doing it for the gram, you know. Yeah, yeah this guy here. <laughs> 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 Especially <Yeah. laughs> He's been in Brussels for one day and he's already got a whole story full of Brussels. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, in Jazz's situation, when he could be meaningfully engaging with his environment, he's focusing on the appearance. Not him personally, because I know what he does in the background as well, but other people don't do the same, right? People will. They'll find a lovely nature reserve. There's a sea, there's sand, the sun's shining, there's no clouds, and then there's birds, and there's a nice big rock. And then they'll, they'll each go up to the rock, do the same pose, get their friends to take a photo of them. And then you see that night, four or five different accounts posting the same picture, same pose, but it's different people. And they, they go there so they can produce content for their social media page. And there's a lack of meaningful engagement with their surrounding here. They're not making the most of that moment. And it's, it's obvious, we, we, we all know this anyway. There's, not, there's no point in going too much into detail with this, but there's a nice quote from Irving Singer in, uh, the, in his book, The Harmony of Nature and Spirit. He says, the happy man or woman is the one whose relationship with the environment is harmonious. I'm paraphrasing a little here, but. A life that consists of meaningful interaction with our surroundings is the basis for satisfying whatever desires arise in us. So the authentic essential values. And we need that meaningful interaction to do that. Now, the impact this has on our ability to apply meaning, this uh, prioritization of appearances over art, is that there's a desire to appear something rather than be something. You want to appear as if though you're successful. So you make sure you wear the best brands and you eat at the best restaurants and you're seen doing this. And if you're not seen doing this, you make sure that all the social media see you doing this. And you invest more of your energy into appearing like you're a successful sports person or a businessman. Or I had friends who were paying to be in the football club's academy, but posting pictures of the club's shirt like yeah uh been scouted by and like yeah they're sponsoring me and and this type of thing and it it didn't exist it was it was the intention of appearing like they're successful rather than working towards that success and instead of investing that time into mastering an art whatever it may be that fuels you you invest it all into appearances and advertisements make sure of this right you have you have the uh Imagine the wise contemplative man, he's sitting by the fireplace and he's got his whiskey and his cigar and this image alone has sold thousands of cigarettes or cigars and alcohol bottles, right? Because you think you're, you have problems, you're a middle-aged man and, and things aren't going so great for you either and you see this man sitting there and he's got the charisma and he's got the authority sitting in his leather armchair and he's drinking the whiskey and he's smoking whatever he's smoking. So when you, when you go to 
your fireplace or when you go to your living room and then you get yourself your whiskey and you get yourself your cigarette and then you start smoking it and you identify with that man and you feel that you feel that authority and charisma but it's got nothing to do with the whiskey or the cigarette it's in entirely something else you're Patriarchy, that's what it is. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. We have it with aftershave as well, perfume. You spray the perfume or aftershave, all the guys or girls come running after you when you lift your arms, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this idea is it, it's trying to attain something for appearances alone rather than uh, infor- reinforcing that with a substance in behind the curtains. And as we know, appearances are fragile. They can disappear, they can change, they can be altered, they can be polluted by anyone externally as well as yourself. Someone says something, your appearance is gone, your whole reputation is damaged. And appearances, basing your success and your self-esteem on how you appear, whether it's through social media or something else, it's fragile. It, is, it, it could disappear instantly. It, it doesn't take much. And if you're not reinforcing that with that internal uh, desire or drive to excel in a certain art or wh- whatever it is you want to excel in or appear like you've excelled in then if that appearance breaks there's nothing left holding you there's no scaffolding to hold the building up and that's that skeleton the scaffolding is what w- even without an appearance gives you the ability to have that meaning and to say well okay people might think this of me but I know this it helps you maintain and sustain that self-esteem and confidence a threefold solution uh, for all the problems mentioned so far harmonizing our production consumption rates as I've said now number one productive communication interaction this theory is based on a theory of meaning by Elaine de Botton he says to attain meaning in life Uh, there's no one set route but through communication understanding and service we can do that and I use that and it works I use that to apply uh, harmony to our production consumption rates through productive communication and interaction productive understanding and productive service now for the first one productive communication interaction this includes but isn't restricted to communicating and interacting with others, sharing experiences with others. So, Aristotle's Politics, uh, book one, he talks about why man is a political animal, and he traces us back to the initial partnership between two people. These two people then form a household, the household turns into a neighborhood, the neighborhood turns into a village, and so forth, until it becomes a state. The, The beginning, the origins of anything, any sort of uh, gathering, human gathering, is partnership, he says. We share experiences, and that's how we gain strength as humans. Epicurus, uh, one of the keys to happiness, he says, is friends. He says, give me a block of cheese and a group of friends, and I'll show you a feast. You don't need much. You need a block of cheese, but as long as you have the friends there, I'll show you a good feast. And there's a study done in uh, 2014 by Society for Personality and Social Psychology, they talk about the considerable impact of meaningful relationships with friends, colleagues, co-workers, family, uh, partners, anyone, for uh, avoiding low states of mental well-being and maintaining high levels of happiness. As long as you're sharing experiences, you maintain that. It's a productive form of communication. It's not going on social media, scrolling, double tapping, liking. This isn't productive. This is consuming data and pictures and captions and likes and comments online is a state of excessive consumption it's not productive communication now as well as uh, interacting with other people there's a study done by King's College London my old university in 2018 Uh, it talks about they monitor I think it's 108 people for a week on an app and it has their geotagging locations uh, so they know wherever they are and they they log their data when they feel down up whatever and they concluded that trees bird song the sky and the outdoors in general were responsible for most people in London most of their well-being or brief moments of feeling up and alive and this was especially true for people who they had already registered as uh, prone for impulsivity they, were imp- they had impulsive traits. 
and it benefited them more than anyone else. And impulsivity is a big detriment to mental health. Impulsive behavior, self-destructive behavior. So productively interacting with your environment, grounding yourself in nature, or just stopping and being aware of things is a huge benefit. There's an example I want to give. Uh, this point is going on a bit longer, but uh, say you've got nothing to do in the day and you're, you're craving strawberries. That's your only purpose for the day. You, you want to attain strawberries somehow and consume strawberries. And you're not in any rush and you've got nowhere to be. And a mile down the road, you have a market, normal supermarket. They sell strawberries in that plastic packaging. And five miles down the road, you have a strawberry picking farm like I do in my hometown. I used to love it. You have the option here. You want strawberries. That's the only purpose. And wh whichever one you choose, you're going to get the same amount of strawberries. So you either get in your car and you drive to the market, you buy the strawberries, and then you come home. Or alternatively, you sit on your sofa, go on the laptop, you order your groceries online. Someone brings the strawberries to you, even carries it into your house, and drops it off in front of your fridge. So to attain those strawberries, you open the door, and then you walk to the kitchen, you bend over, you pick up the strawberries, and then you eat them. That's, that's the only level of interaction you have before you consume those strawberries. On the other hand, you call a friend, you say, come on, let's go to, let's go to the farm, five miles down the road. It's a nice day, we'll take a walk. If it's raining, you take an umbrella. You walk there, first step. You're walking with a friend. Might not have to be with a friend. If it's not, then you just interact with your environment. You listen to the birds, you smell the plants as you're going. So you walk to the farm and you walk out into the, you grab your basket and then you walk out into the fields and then you're pulling away the leaves and you're looking for the juiciest strawberries. You want to find the best looking strawberries and you invest, you invest time and effort into it. You touch, you feel, you look, you smell and you're engaging almost all of your senses within this process. There's more of a relationship you build with those strawberries than there is the one you either drive or order from the market. So that process it's not the, the satisfaction you gain from the end goal, the strawberries, isn't inherent within those strawberries. It's within the relationship and the process preceding that, the work that comes before that, that makes that, that set of strawberries more meaningful or less meaningful. And productive communication, as well as human interaction, you've got to bear that in mind with even the smallest activities, such as eating strawberries. The amount of work you put in is the amount of satisfaction and meaning you get out of it. And it harmonizes not excessive consumption or just base consumption where you just order at home or meaningless production where you just drive and get it. It's, it's, it's striking that right balance with that example. Number two, productive understanding. This, this I'm gonna keep this a bit shorter. This is just solving some sort of confusion or a gray area of personal interest. So there's something that is of interest to you, something you're curious about, and it's satisfying that with some newfound knowledge or learning within that area, advancing within that area. And th this doesn't apply to what we were saying about bullshit jobs or tasks. It's about things that are true to you, things that you truly desire subjectively. And it gives you the opportunity to cling to life through things that are meaningful for you, through tasks that are meaningful for you. You gain understanding within that area. And three, productive service, giving back. Increasing your understanding in an area that is suited to you personally and subjectively and taking that understanding and manifesting it within some sort of observable service. So it's a, it's a process of extending yourself. You, you, you form an extension of yourself into some observable manifestation within your service. And Plato talks about this in the symposium. Well, Socrates does. But uh, he says, love is the reproduction of that which you find truly beautiful. So he says there's lovers of body, just the physical. And all they seek is to reproduce the beauty of that. They, they aim to reproduce and bring up good and proper children, you know, physically and mentally successful children. That is, their, that is the height of their reproduction and service to this world. It's what they leave behind. On the other hand, he says there's lovers of intellect and wisdom. 
And they seek to reproduce that in all their endeavours. In all their activities, they seek to reproduce that which is good. So, if we seek to reproduce that which is good for us and beautiful for us subjectively, we're engaging in some sort of productive service. We're giving back that which we truly want to understand and do better in. And it gives purpose because when you're just a single person, the moment you provide a service for someone else and you see them benefiting from that service, you can observe that. There's, there's an opportunity for you to observe what you have planted within someone else. It gives you purpose because you can see purpose. You can see why that was meaningful. What you have done is meaningful. And if meaning is necessary for good mental well-being, then this solution is presumably very helpful. Uh, the productive communication, then the understanding, and then the service. And all in all, this solution doesn't exhaust all the ways to... No way does it uh, exhaust all the possible ways of healing oneself or improving one's mental well-being and happiness. But I'm hoping that this uh, gives a more practical option for the ordinary person. You don't have to be an intellectual. You don't have to go through the books and read Carl Jung, Freud, Plato, Buddha. Uh, you don't have to have enough money to invest in a professional and see a private psychologist every week. You can do these changes, you can make these changes if you're anyone, anywhere around the world. Just small productive changes to your habits and lifestyle that will hopefully increase your happiness and well-being in life and harmonize your production and consumption. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Cheers.